Welcome. Um, thank you so much for being here. My name is Colleen Cullen, um, and I'm the genealogy and community history librarian uh, here at the library. So before we get started, I'm just going to let you know about a few programs that we have coming up. Um, you may be interested in, in attending those as well. So we have um, genealogy walk-in assistance once a month at each location. And so the dates um, that are upcoming are February 13th here at Santori, the 14th at West, and the 16th at Eola. Um, and those are all on our website. And again, it's, it's every month. Um, then we have um, in March, uh, something called Invisible Warriors, an introduction to the film. So um, this is uh, going to be the producer talking about the film. Um, the film shares the individual experiences of a small group of ladies who represent the 600,000 Black women who fled lives as domestics and sharecroppers to work in the factories and U.S. government offices during World War II. Um, so these uh, patriotic pioneers share their wartime memories, recounting their battles against racism at home, Nazism abroad, and sexism everywhere. So again, that's just the introduction. It's on March 5th um, at 2 p.m. And then we'll be streaming that film all week. And then there'll be a closing Q&A session on March 15th. And that is at 7 p.m. And then if anyone here has little kids in their life, we have um, a family history story time and craft on March 30th at 10 a.m. And we'll have a presentation by the GAR Museum in April, on April 10th. And that's called Unveiling the Hidden Warrior, an analysis on women in the U.S. military. And that's um, to correspond with the exhibit that G the GAR will have at that time. Okay, <laughs> so without further ado, let me introduce our speaker tonight. Uh, Sherman Jenkins is a full-time author, president of a digital media company, and serves as alderman at large for the city of Aurora. Mm -hmm. Prior to these achievements, he served as executive director for economic development for the city of Aurora for approximately 25 years. Mr. Jenkins led a negotiating team that landed the Chicago Premium Outlet Mall. He is the author of Ted Strong Jr., the untold story of an original Harlem Globetrotter and Negro Leagues All-Star. And he is currently working on his second book, which I'll tell you about tonight. Um, Mr. Jenkins lives in Aurora, is married and has three grown children and three grandchildren. So please join me in welcoming Sherman Jenkins. <laughs> thank you, Kylie. Uh, and thank you everyone for coming out tonight. And uh, we, we're, we're, we're basically going to try to do this within an hour. Now, so I'm going to ask that if you have any questions, you can hold them to the end uh, and then we can try to answer those. Uh, because um, we want to be respectful of your time, but also we also know we have people online, like uh, and I think we're online now. I see Mary Dory, Dory uh, there. Hey, Mary and Mary Folks, and oh, thanks a lot. I see a lot of familiar faces and all that are out there tonight, and um, on Zoom, okay, and uh, it's also on Facebook. But um, one of the things that I want to be able to do as we get going here. Is it? Is it? Yeah. Turn them down a little bit. Perfect. Perfect. All right. All right. <laughs> It's not working, Tyler. Well, anyway, why don't we get this technical uh, glitch taken care of? It's not advancing. Oh, yeah, I see. Okay, got it. All right, got it. Yeah, there you go. All right, so again, you know, I'm here talking about uh, the uh, African Americans in Aurora from 1922. No, 1921 to 1955. Now, I know there's a number of you who probably remember when I was talking about this, or we were going to go up until uh, to, to 
2017, when we elected our first African-American mayor. But I wanted to get this done sometime this millennium. And so I had to shorten it up. And then I'm going to be encouraging those of you who are out there who have the, the inkling to write. You can pick it up from 1955 and take it forward. And this is what I'm doing because there was a book written uh, and I'll get into that later in terms of what got me here. But as she mentioned in the bio, I'm president of SOJ Communications. I am also a member of the Sabre Society of American Baseball Research, uh, Negro League Baseball League's committee. And she mentioned I uh, serve as alderman at large here in the city of Aurora. And I'm a board member emeritus of the Aurora Public Library Foundation. And I'm a founding member of the Quad County African American Chamber of Commerce. Now, those are just some of the things, but I think what you probably get to a situation is, is why are you writing this book? You know, people have always asked me this. The book has not been written yet. I've already had some people say, can I get a copy tonight? No, nah, unfortunately, you're not going to be able to copy tonight. But we're working to try to get this done, the research and all, within the year, within the next year, year and a half. We're, we're, we're fortunate because I feel that, and others I think, is that the Aurora's history that people today and the future generations need to know what we know. They need, it's, this is a report on what we found through interviews with a number of folks, and a number of here are here with us tonight. And uh, also our review of the Aurora Beacon News uh, microfilm and with through the help of the uh, Aurora Public Library genealogy department and reviewing artifacts from the Aurora Historical Society. And I'm asking your help. There's a number of you out here, and you've been some, a number of you have been very helpful in introducing me to a number of African Americans who I can be able to interview. And I've interviewed them, I'm putting them on videotape. I remember one uh, time they're videotaping someone uh, who were renamed, renamed, be named nameless, renamed nameless, who said, oh my God, you're going to videotape me. See, you're going to catch me saying this, this, that, and the other. You're like, you're like, just a conversation. We're just going to have a conversation. And so we do videotape because we want it for posterity. You want to be able to see what that person was talking about, to see the person, because we're now a, what, a visual society now. We, we like the visuals, although there's a number of us in here that still like to read that good hardcover book, but there's still those who are in, in, in terms of the whole aspect of the visuals. And through that, in terms of, of making that happen, I want you, if you can be able to help us to be able to identify individuals, if there's information here that you hear that you say, eh, that's a little bit, correct us on it. But also the the written work is basically taken from, uh, I'm following up, as I said earlier, uh, from the book, From Slavery to Glory, African-Americans come to Aurora, 1850 to 1920 by local historian, Dennis Buck. So I'm taking it from 1921 to 1955. Because what, how many of you have read Dennis's book, uh, African-Americans in Aurora? Raise your hand. All right, some of you have read that book. And one of the things he mentions in, in, the, in, the, uh, uh, in, in, in the fact that he slid in here and he didn't say anything, and, uh, but I'm glad he is here, and the author Dennis Buck, is uh, that he said in the book, he said, look, I've taken it to this point. We need somebody else to take it further. And I remember after my book, first book came out, I got a call from Dennis. And then he said, you know what? You asked me, am I going to do a second version of this book? And, uh, you know, and I told you, no. I said, that's right. I understand why you won't do it. He said, you know what? You know who could do it? I said, who? Oh. He said, you. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, okay. Then I sat down and I, I just wrote out a list of African-Americans I had worked with at the city of Aurora. And I came up with about 44, 45 names of individuals that I had known, worked with, talked to, interacted with in the community. And I said, why not? Give it a shot, let's, let's start this. So we started it and we began to interview folks and 
The one thing that I, I love is a quote from a good friend of mine. His name is Larry Lester. He is one of the premier researchers of Negro League baseball in the country, really in the world. And Larry says, we are drowning in information, but starving for knowledge. We are, we are drowning in information, but we're starving for knowledge. And I think one of the things that uh, that is so true about that is that there are individuals out here, African Americans, and even others, whether you're Caucasian, uh, Hispanic, you probably have, you dealt with a number of African Americans, and you probably might have been the person who was in partnership with the person who owned a place called the Gippers Club. Anybody ever heard of the Gippers Club? Raise your hand. I know there's a couple here, they don't want to acknowledge me. <laughs> but the Gippers Club was a place that I learned about where they, uh, it was located here in downtown Aurora. And it was a place where Cal Basie, Duke Ellington came and performed and performed here in Aurora. Yeah, it shocked me too. I was like, in Aurora? Yeah, yeah, they came down. Well, so where's this Gippers? Where was it? Well, it was over there by uh, Robert Hall. Who remembers Robert Hall? <laughs> I, I got my seat set too. <laughs> yeah, showed up. And it was like, okay, all right. And so we've been trying to find, uh, you know, where the exact location is, and we're still working on that. And the other aspect is, you know, when you when you think about this and you look at from the standpoint of of how you get to this. I'm going to give this big shout out now to a number of individuals, and you see their names up here. Um, Mr. Cowherd, before he passed away, I interviewed him. Alan Claire Kennedy, uh, Sonny Robinson, uh, uh, Ms. Juanita Wells, and Arthur George Fuller, and Ms. Ms. Beverly Peterson, and Sean and Eric uh, Cannon, and Township Supervisor Davis Offit. There's a vast number of people who have been able to provide us with information and, and searching, and we need help from more individuals. You know of someone who was born in the 30s, in the 40s, who came here, who lived here, let them know what we're doing. And if they have artifacts, photos, slides, you won't take them. You know, with, this, with the digital age today, you take this, this little thing called a smartphone, and you can take a digital copy of it, and that person now has that, that print is now a digital copy that they can keep and pass on to other family members. Because Ms. Peterson, she knows she, she shocked me. I thought she was going to have like a sheet of slides, and she came in with six carousels <laughs> of slides back from the 50s and the 60s. And we're still going through it all. But you can, you can scan a slide, a print, and make a digital copy of it. And for you to be able to keep, and for us to be able to use as we go forward with this book. I want to also thank, as I mentioned before, the Royal Public Library Genealogy Department. Ali has been a, a godsend in terms of helping. She, I come in and I go to review the uh, microfilm. And every time I come in, she's back there and I, and I got a story to tell her. Oh yeah, I talked to this person. I talked, and she's just she's she listens intently. And I don't know, if she's really saying, I wish she would hurry up so I can get back to work or what the deal is. But she listens and then she's encouraged. She was the one that came up with this idea. She said, Hey, why don't you give a presentation about what you found so far? And I was like, okay. And then I just got another idea tonight from a longtime friend of mine. I'm gonna go into that one. And I also want to thank my family, my children, uh, my Ayana and Quasi. My son is sitting back there. They both attended uh, and they attended uh, Nancy Hill School and they went to West Aurora. And as a proud daddy, he, he played on the 1997 team that went down state and just lost by five points to Gloria Manuel. But uh, they, they came in second in the state in basketball in 1997. And my wife, Juliette, is sitting next to my son. Wave your hand, sweetheart. Wave your hand, let him know. Yeah, I am back now, okay? <laughs> and my grandkids, Jai, Michaela, and Xavier. And a number of you have met my grandkids, or if you haven't met them personally, you know you've seen them on Facebook because I'm always, you know, showing it out there. So 
I want to get right into it in terms of starting in the, in the 1920s in Aurora. And I call, right now calling it growth, discovery, and quiet existence. Um, in the 20s, there was 36,000, over 36,000 people that lived in Aurora. Uh, and that was up from 24,000 in 1900. And there were 638 African Americans in Aurora in, 19, in 1920. Now, you have to remember in 1920, Prohibition began, and there was a rise of this little group called with three initials, KKK. And 1921 and subsequent years, a number of articles about African Americans in the Beacon were not favorable. You read some of these articles, you would be, you just have to think that's, that's all. That's all we're about. And as we've gone through 1921, you know, this is just a sample, May 9th, 1921. Ku Klux Klan causes alarm. Some colored folk here had mistaken idea, secret society. Oh, I, oh. oh. oh okay. All right. I think I better grab this. Give me a second. Is that better? Yes. All right. Sorry about that. And um, all right. And uh, the May 9th, 1921, uh, plan causes alarm. Some colored folk here had mistaken ideas. Secret society was hostile to them. African Americans held a meeting to talk about the KKK and what it meant with regards to African Americans in Aurora, but also across the country. And the headline says some colored folk here had mistaken identity. The secret society was hostile to them. So as we've gone and looked at, through all of this, okay, as we've gone through this, we've seen articles that just shake your head. And this is in terms of finding anything in there in the beacon. Again, this is 1921. So, you know, they were taking they were taking it from AP wires, except for this one, May 9th, 1921. That was a, a, a local article that was written. But a lot of these were from the AP associated with wires uh, that they ran in the beacon uh, during that time or that particular situation. And as we uh so between 1860 and 1920, the majority of African Americans moving into Aurora arrived, you know, in a family unit. And there's another story in terms of, and some people might have heard about this, was that African Americans who came up from the South to escape what was going on in the South came up from either from Alabama or Mississippi, from Kentucky. And they would come up past what is known as um, is uh, Plano uh, and uh, also Plainfield. And there was a farm owned by a white gentleman who uh, allowed African Americans to stay on the on the air on the farm there. And they had those who had family members reached out to those who were in the war and they talked to them with regards to helping them finding places to stay and places to where they could be able to uh, find a job. And through that effort, there was this whole network of helping of African Americans and others helping folks come up from the South to find a place to stay, even get a, a home built, and then being able to go and then they would go to go to the various churches, when a lot of churches like Main Street Baptist Church and uh, and St. John AME, and they would go there and learn of various job opportunities. So there was already this network. And a number of people that came up through Plainfield came up and they went and stayed in an area which is now known as Pattersonville. And I'll get into that a little bit more. Um, with a small population, uh, African Americans were unable to unite for social betterment and mutual improvement, although their economic standing did improve. I mean, there, you see from these articles here how uh, they were encouraging African Americans to go out and to vote, to unite as one. 
you even saw at St. John AME paid off their, their, their mortgage. I mean, that, now that was some of the positive news that got reported in the paper in terms of what African Americans were doing. But again, it was a quiet growth discovery situation. And as we continue on, as more African Americans came to Aurora, they lived with other family members, congregated in pockets on the east side on North Broadway Avenue. Now, one of the things that we've uh, found is that uh, North Broadway had its challenges for African Americans and whites. And the Beacon News covered it regularly. And they had raids. Uh, they had um, uh, uh, really came out and said, we're going to close North Broadway because there's a number of houses of ill repute. And uh, so in working with John Jaros here from the uh, uh, Rural Historical Society and his staff, they've been able to help us to uncover more information that you're going to find out about it once you read the book. <laughs> we ain't going to give you too much information where you see you got the clip note version so you don't need to buy a book. So, but there was things that were going on and Aurora was just, was always known as the mini Chicago where people came here and they could do things and, 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 and with the jobs and so forth. And then the other aspect of it was, there was things that people did. Uh, there was baseball. And a number of what they call the, the colored teams came and played here in Aurora. And they came out from Chicago. And so African-Americans in Aurora learned what the country learned and they heard too often. And this was, one of them had to do with the Tulsa uh, race riots in June of 1921. And this is how the uh, Beacon, uh, with various articles, reported uh, what was going on uh, in Tulsa. And we also then learned of, in 1919, the riots that occurred in Chicago, the Red Summer, that it was pretty much known from 1919 on up with regards to the situations that had been occurring. So the 20s, again, was times of, of growth, discovery, quiet existence. But people, went as they, at what we're seeing and what we're hearing from individuals as they've been telling us is that we, we really, people found a way that allowed them to make a, 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 a living here and to be able to grow and and allow their families to grow and live uh, an existence that they didn't have down in the South. And so to come here was just a, a, a great and grand opportunity. And um, we, we, one of the things that, you know, I think we, we have to also remember is that um, there's a lot of information, as I said before, that we're drowning in, but we also have to make sure that what we already have existing here in terms of publication that you have to take advantage of them and take a look at them. And uh, like The Gentle Spirit, the memoirs uh, by Marie Wilkinson that was compiled by Kathleen Snow. Legendary Locals of Aurora by Joe Fidel Higgins. Uh, uh, the Underground Railroad, Illinois by Jeanette Tilly Turner. And if you, if you ever read that book in terms of Aurora being one of the stops on the Underground Railroad and saw how there was a number of uh, churches and all here that, that helped African Americans through the Underground Railroad to go to Canada. But then also, as I mentioned about the slavery to glory, but also a new book that just came out called Blackface, Menstrual in Aurora, Illinois, an historical and, so and sociological perspective. A very interesting book. But if you, if you wanna learn more, and, and not just for Black History Month, Black History Month is every month, okay? You, you can pick this book up at the Royal Historical Society. You can also go to, to uh, uh, Amazon, Bart, and Barnes and & Noble, whatever, but you can pick it up right down the street here at the uh, Historical Society. And so as we move from the 20s and get into the 30s, the census showed the total population of Aurora was 46,000 folks, with 936 of them being African Americans. Now what happened in the 30s? We had the Great Depression, the worst economic downturn in the history of the industrialized world, which began in 1929 and finished up and went until about 1939. 
And from the stories we've heard from our raw African Americans, many things they did in order to make a living. I mean, washing sheets and shirts for white business owners, uh, making butter cakes. What do they call butter cakes now? I heard one. Somebody don't know what a butter cake is. There's got to be more than one person here knows what a butter cake is. Pound cake. That's right. Pound cake. Called butter cakes back in the day. Um, and wait, making wedding cakes and, and uh, a number of different uh, facilities and organizations like the Royal Country Club employed African Americans as bartenders at night. And women made drapes for the uh, for the uh, Royal Country Club. And you know, also as always been, African American churches helped African Americans here in Aurora sustain life in Aurora. You know, from uh, Main Street Baptist Church to St. John AME to Progressive to a number of the churches that we have today. They helped African Americans sustain a life that they could be able to go and move forward on. And the, the one aspect that, you know, if we keep going through the 30s is that you had um, uh, the aspect of Aurora's growth. And in 1931, the Paramount, uh, Paramount Theater opened as the first air-conditioned building outside of Chicago. And the grandfather of Ms. Murtis Bordello ran a janitorial service, this African-American, that featured the Paramount as one of his clients. Now, she's been having, uh, uh, she's been very, she, she lives out east and she's been traveling, but we're going to be sitting down with her getting more information with regards to the type of work that he did. But between 1937 and 1938, some of the most famous blues composers and artists, famous now, back then, probably didn't recognize, a lot of folks didn't recognize, but there was a strike in Chicago uh, and among the musicians. And in order to make the recordings, they came out to Aurora's Leland Tower, the Sky Club, and they recorded these uh, uh, blues songs that are well uh, well-renowned uh, today, and it was done right here in Aurora. And there was a number of individuals who also worked at that time. The Leland was known as the Leland Hotel, and we found that there was a number of African Americans who worked at the Leland Hotel. And there's more stories and all that's going to be that's going to come out with regards to that. One of that one of those was the Leland Hotel, and I mentioned about the Sky Club and um, that photo here at the bottom, uh, the color photo there, the lady at the bottom uh, is the um, is the mother, Miss Maddie Patterson. Uh, and she worked at the Sky Club uh, in her later years. And so and we're interviewing, and, and this whole thing on, on the book is about what was it like living in Aurora? What did you do? What did you do? How did you... You know what was life? You know what? Did, what did you do to, for for acti activities? What were some of the things that? What was it like? And 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 that's what this whole book is going to be about. It's just talking about life and how people were able to succeed and move forward uh, in their time here in the city of Aurora. And as I go forward here, we get to the forties. Now, it's very interesting as you look and see with regards to the 40s and what happened then. It showed that the census of Aurora's population was in close to 50,000 people. We're getting close to 1,000 African Americans. And a lot of African Americans, like others, moved to Aurora for jobs and opportunity for a better life. Now, a number of you who are in this room know of individuals who came here during that time. And they were also individuals who uh, were able to get jobs and being able to advance in themselves up in society. Uh, and one other thing that we found was that uh, that John Hope, uh, John Franklin White, who's the father of Cynthia Ann White Cummings, was the first baby born at Copley Hospital on July 14, 1913. Uh, Ms. Cummings was born at St. Uh, St. Joseph Hospital in 1941. Who knows where St. Joseph Hospital was located? 
some of y'all was probably born there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> about, that's what I'm talking about. See these, these stories that are there, and 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 some of you, who so who doesn't know where St. John Joseph Hospital was located? All right, who wants to who wants to let them know? I will. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay, it's right by Wilder Park on Lake Street. I so, have to stand up and face it. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay. We all know where Lake Street is, right? So Lake Street going north. So where Wilder Park is, where the old police or the other police department was that they tore down, right across the street, that big, huge building, that was St. Joseph's Hospital. Um, got it? Got a good vision? So what is the other, uh, is it um, North Park? No, what is the street that, that runs across? West Park. Park. North West Park. Park. West Park. West Park. Okay, so West Park and Lake Street. You got it now? All right. So that was just one of them. And you know, you heard about Copley, where Copley was located. And there was another one that we'll get into in a little later. But the one thing that young African-American children had no knowledge of was, was coming was World War II. And the articles in the Beacon talked about the conflict long before it became what it was. And the interesting one here on the far right, Nazi retreat from Ukraine mm -hmm. becomes route. That was 1941. Talking about Ukraine in 1941. And as history shows us, December 7, 1941, mm -hmm. it's like for a lot of folks and what happened with regards to um, that particular time and effort. And we, again, trying to give a person, give the reader an understanding of what African-Americans experienced and what they did in terms of being able to, to live during these times from the 20s on up and you get into the 40s, and you see some of the things that happen, as I mentioned there, but then to see the African-Americans signed up and they were inducted to fight for freedom overseas. And these are some articles, uh, this one article, uh, photo here, uh, as it says, these colored selectees uh, showing at the Aurora City Hall for final instructions. There's a number of folks in there and there's one lady, her dad is in this picture. And we found that as we, we worked with uh, John Jaros at the Aurora Historical Society, who brought this to our attention and have that in their collection. And then also the photo on the right shows um, um, other young men who were signing up. And what we saw from these photos were credits. And at the bottom, if you can't see them on there, but it says uh, credit pictures from also uh, from um, also photo and oh no photo by also now those of you who might remember i came here in 82 and there was a place called also photoshop and there was a person by the name of the uh, people by the name of don and sue stevens that ran also photoshop and, and don was uh, one heck of a guy who could print up pictures and black and white and shot and, and that's where you got your hallmark cards and all that great stuff there also photoshop which is now a craft urban restaurant, okay? Does anyone know what happened to the negatives, the pictures from also Photoshop? Any of you who are on Facebook or on Zoom, if you know, contact us. We want to find out, we'd love to review them. So please let us know, because that would have been a, a, a plethora of information and history uh, that was right there and uh, under, on our fingertips. And uh, some of the names in these pictures here, Leonard D. Lewis, otherwise known as Booty. <laughs> number of folks remember Booty. And Willie McGee and George Greer. Uh, anyone out here? I know there's one person related to him. Anyone else out here related to any of these individuals? All right, you may know of some individuals. We'll talk about it a little later. But uh, the, the, the other aspect about this, and as we're doing it, is to show what life was about. What this is, this is a, a, a picture, and this photo was provided uh, by Mr. Robert Dean Jr. and Miss Beverly Peterson, who we've interviewed. And this is uh, their father, uh, 
uh, Mr. Robert Dean Sr. And he fought in Okinawa during World War II. And this is from their photo collection, as well as the photos to the left there, uh, which would be of the Pattersons. When we talk about Pattersonville, you know, some, the Pattersons were a large family. You know, at some point when I first came here and they talked about the Pattersons, I met some of them. I thought, well, everybody in the world is African American must be Patterson. <laughs> and I realized it was just one heck of a large family. And they 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 uh, they were well known in in, in the uh, in the community, and the uh, the aspect that you see from these photos is that they they really uh, they, they they fought they came back after the war and they had family and faith and business opportunities were realized and they continued to have and grow their family and live a life beyond what sometimes we even heard and learned about specifically in Aurora. And so, you know, the one other thing that we found was that there was a place called, and it's there now called the Grand Boulevard Center. Now, how many of you are familiar with the Grand Boulevard Center on the east side on Grand Boulevard? It's at 1226 Grand Boulevard. Now we were told that it was started uh, by veterans after World War II around in the mid 40s. Um, and how many of you remember or know or heard what the original name of the Grand Boulevard Center was? Well, in the 1946 Aurora City Directory, 1226 Grand Boulevard uh, had cultural culture club listed. In the 1948 directory, the club was listed as the Aurora Cultural Culture Club. By 1955, it was listed with three names, Aurora Cultural Club, Carver Adult Club, and Dunbar Youth Center. Who remembers when the name was changed to Grand Boulevard Center? Well, there was a gentleman, it's a gentleman by the name of Mr. Arthur George Fuller, who came to Aurora as a child in 1945, and he lived at 1219 Grand Boulevard. And he provided this information to us and said, because I asked him about the Grand Boulevard Center, and, and he said, no, nah, no, nah, that, 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 that wasn't the name. The name was the name was Cultural, Cultural Club. And it was a place where the seniors could go and, and, and spend their, their days there where, you know, and there was for young people. So it was a much bigger. And he said, I knew because it was right across the street from us. But then we found out that his home was also a place because his father was a pastor. And a lot of people came to their home to be able to hang out in the young kids. And you say, yeah, we used to go there and we played bid whist, and we played uh, uh, games and we had sock hop. And who all remember what a sock hop was? <laughs> I know some of y'all kind of shame to raise your hand. <laughs> okay, I know you shame to raise your hand, but I know you know, I ain't gonna call you out. But yeah, those sock hops and so forth. And through that, you know, that's where African Americans there on the East Side began to just go and hang out and people that that's what they they, they had their fun and uh, so we we're, we're asking African Americans what everyday life was like you know some of us told us as I mentioned before they lived in Pattersonville and a number of them always talked about how they would walk to downtown Aurora get that walk from Pattersonville off of Farnsworth New York Street you walk from there, you walk to downtown Aurora. And you ask them, what did they do? And they said, they went, went to the movie theaters, went to the movies. And uh, we would go in and I said, well, when you were walking, they said they walked in groups, you know, and some of them. And they said, I said, well, did you walk? Were you ever accosted? Did people yell out and say things to you? I said, no. And they said, we got down to the movie theater. I said, where did you go? And we had six movie theaters in downtown Aurora at that time. And uh, I said, well, you regulated to sit in the back of the, of the theater? No, we could sit wherever we wanted. And I said, well, what did you do afterwards? Well, then we would probably go over to Crestes or the five, the five, five and Dime. Okay, most of y'all know the five and Dime. I'm <laughs> someone that looked like, what is he talking about? Uh, on Broadway, which is now the venue, okay? And that was the Kreskis, and they would go in and get a soda and a hot dog and sit and 
with their friends and talk and laugh and have a great time and then get up and walk back home. Never was accosted, never had any problems. And one told me, he says, well, you know, there was one situation where uh, we, we saw these white kids and they were across the street and there was one of ours, they had a beef with one of them. And so we just formed a circle and told them, have at it. And they got to fighting and once they got it out of them, everybody said, all right, see y'all tomorrow, talk to you later, bye. And that was it. So these, it, it's, it was a, a situation that as you then advanced into the 50s, you had a situation where um, there was African-Americans who really, uh, you know, had come back, they went into the Korean War, and I think, you know, a lot of us remember the Korean War and what that uh, brought about. And that photo that you see there is a gentleman that some of us in this room know, Mr. Warren Kent, when he was uh, in the Navy, um, about to go over to, uh, uh, to Korea. And uh, compliments of his family. Uh, and they, another, again, some of you may have relatives and all that have crates of pictures, like the, the Cannons, uh, Sean Cannon, his brother Eric told me, my daddy and mama didn't throw anything away. And I didn't believe him until I went to the house and he came out with five crates <laughs> of all of these photos that they had taken with those instant Polaroid cameras and all that, they kept every freaking thing. But it's, it's a treasure of things of what we did during these times. And so gradually as the African-American population saw as young excel in school, uh, you know, and as I mentioned, some of the parents were involved in the Korean conflict. Then there was this thing that was called the Brown versus Board of Education ruling on May 17, 1954, and the murder of uh, Emmett Till, which stirred many. Now, the, the one aspect of this was that uh, when the Supreme Court ruling came out, <laughs> I remember interviewing uh, an individual here, and I said, wow, you, uh, you know, they had the 1954, you were in high school, you were at West High, and what was it, what did you think about the fact that they passed a ruling? And he looked at me and turned his head and said, we were already integrated. Oh. And then he showed me the photos, and you see all of these. Yes, the majority was whites, but there was a number of African Americans and a number of people in this room who went to school and and uh, went to school with whites. And he said, We were already integrated. So I didn't mean jack to us. So I'm like, Okay, all right, interesting, interesting to, to learn that. And then you had the murder of Emma Till. Now, this one story, when I learned that, uh, and because as we interview him, we ask him about historic things that occurred during these times, during these decades. And I said, well, what did you guys, what did you think about him with regards to Emmett Till? And this one story that came out was, uh, she said, you know, we were very upset. We want, we want to do something. And so we decided, a number of my friends and all, we decided we were going to go down to Presky's in Broadway. We were going to stage a sit-in. So they went down and sat there, and they were expecting that they were not going to get served. Well, what happened was people came up and said, hey, girl, hey, so-and-so, hi, hey, how's your family? And they realized the people working there were people they grew up with, they went to school with, their mamas and their daddies knew them. And they had already always gone in there and got food, so how is it that they weren't going to get served now? <laughs> so she said, we just quietly got it. Most our way right out of the place. It was rather, you know, embarrassing. But it was important, you know, from the standpoint of understanding what was occurring during those times and how, even though you wasn't in the South, you wanted to do something. And there were efforts by African Americans who sent money by the churches. Some people went down to the South to participate in the civil rights movement. There was that groundswell of African Americans here who wanted to be able to go and be able to work and let people know that they were concerned about 
what was going on in that in that part of, of the country. And as you continue going on in terms of the, the 1950s, uh, there was 1,100 African Americans that live in Aurora, with a population now over 50,000. The word "go to Aurora," good paying job there, was just the talk of the, the, the area. And some of the companies mentioned uh, African Americans that work were like the, the uh, uh, Thor Power Tool Company, All Steel, Western Electric. Who remember when Caterpillar opened up? All right, two, three, all right. And they opened in the mid 50s, mid to late 50s when they opened the big plant. But they never said that plant was in Montgomery. They always said that plant was in Aurora. But who in the heck would have known where Montgomery was anyway? So you had to say Aurora. But these were some of the companies that were there and they hired African Americans. But there was also another thing that we ran across. And you kind of forget the toll highway. And so we've had some African Americans say, yeah, my uncle, he worked on some of the crews, crews that built the interstate highway. And the article that you see there that said to decide on toll or roadway in Valley today. And they basically have this photo here showing how the toll, they call them the toll system, and how it was going to run by Aurora and what it was going to do with regards to that. And so there was people who came up from the South who came and heard about this, these projects they were doing and got on these crews. And they were involved. And you can't see from this one photo here, but there's a number of African Americans that they were plowing the road for the toll highway authority through uh this was this was the, the United States. This is an interstate highway system that was being built. And so this provided job opportunities for people to be able to move and go. And we sometimes we tend to forget that. We get out there, you know, when you're going to Chicago and you jump on it. 88, which when I first moved out, it was called I-5, mm -hmm. had two lane roads, mm -hmm. and I think it was a couple of horse and buggies, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, of that time, and, and, uh, and I see how it has grown. And, uh, and I remember, I went to Northern Illinois University, and uh, I remember riding the Greyhound bus out from Chicago, and we passed her and saw a sign that said, Howard Johnson, uh, off of uh, uh, Route 31, and it was signed saying Aurora. I'm like, what in the hell is Aurora? What is that all about? Never stopped there until one time, came in here and said, oh my goodness, this is one huge town. There's a lot going on in here. And so in the 50s, as we continue, job opportunities and business ventures developed. Barber shops, hair salons, mechanic shops, janitorial services, along with um, uh, people who partnered up with people and came up with uh, forged nightclubs and taverns and dance halls, such as Club 66. Who in this room remember Club 66? I know some of y'all don't want to raise y'all hand, but y'all remember, y'all told me, and y'all <laughs> smile every time y'all mention Club 66. That's where you go down there and finger pop and dance and had you a good time. And then you also had Dean's Barbershop and the daughter. Well, uh, Mr. Dean is here with us, Ms. Beverly Peterson, and she's allowed us to interview her and provided these photos. Uh, and the one photo there, upper left, uh, is from the Aurora Historical Society, John Jaros, and that is the South Street between Spring and New York. And where you see the Budweiser sign is where the uh, Club 66 was in the basement. And Dean's Barbershop was on the first floor level. And there's Mr. Dean and some of his workers uh, cutting hair and doing a little something, something there. People back in the day know what that was. I'm not going to get into that, you know, but uh, they knew what that was all about. And, uh, and that nice, shiny car there on the South Street. And the thing about that strip of area there was on the far left here, where you see the black line sign, that was the original Turner Club. Right now, that's a parking lot for the Aurora uh, Fire Museum. But the fire museum was a firehouse. Mm -hmm. And somewhere along this time was that, um, I, I had to, we wanted to find out was that that whole block was destroyed by fire. 
We're trying to find out when this occurred. Because the reason I wanted to find out, Mr. Dean's uh, son, Robert Jr., was telling me a story about how when he came back from college, he went and uh, he, was, he got a call and they said, hey, you better get down here and bring your camera. You always was taking pictures and taking slides. And he said, come down here because Sonny Liston is down here getting his hair cut. Sonny Liston, what was he doing out in Aurora to get a haircut? <laughs> and he said, no, he was there. And they took pictures of, of Sonny Liston. Now, those of you who don't know, Sonny Liston was a heavyweight champion in the early 60s. He defeated Floyd Patterson, and then he lost to uh, Muhammad Ali, only at that time, Cassius Clay. And uh, he said, yeah, I have the photo. So I said, hey, can I get a picture of that photo? He said, well, my dad, he was so proud of that. He had it you know, posted up on the, on the back of his, uh, uh, his chair there where he cut hair. And then we lost it when they had the fire. And so people are asking, when did this fire occur? Because I had one lady say, yeah, you know, it was something else. That whole block there was taken out by fire. And there was a fire station right there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, let's move on to the next aspect. Uh, you know, quite sure there's a story there somewhere, and we'll, we'll eventually get to it. But there was a number of African-American businesses, as well as some warehousing uh, owned by the Yellens. And I remember the Yellens when I came here, they owned a number of uh, facilities, manufacturing uh, produce facilities here in the downtown. And uh, Mr. Yellen was a very, very interesting, kind uh, gentleman that uh, family was you know, well known and, and, and doing a lot of things here in the city of Aurora. But uh, as you see, the, the opportunities continue to go on and the efforts uh, that our African Americans did in terms of helping the growth of our city was very instrumental in terms of helping us to become the second largest city in the state. Um, we have the chance, but you know, we have a chance to tell this story. And we really need all of you, if you know others out there. And it's not just African Americans, there are those who. Uh, we're, too, we're still trying to find out about this. Uh, we, heard, we knew about the Crystal Lounge, which was another nice hangout spot, I heard. And this whole thing of this Gippers Club and Count Basie and Duke Ellington performing there was a partnership and that I remember that was being told uh, how, again, you had African Americans and Caucasians and, and Hispanics that grew up and went to school here and they forged partnerships and they forged friendships for many years. And a number of them went into uh, to partner on various ventures. And one of those ventures had to do with the Crystal Lounge as well as the, the Gippers Club. And so if anybody, when we're, you know, we were told that if you know from Broadway, Benton and Water Street and Clark Street, Right under the viaduct, over there was that area where the bank is uh, that's located there. That's where the Robert Hall store was located. Mm -hmm. And then to the, to the south of that, supposedly, was this Gippers Club. And we're going to find out. We're going to dig, and we've got a lot more digging to be able to do. But this is just some of the things that show what life was, was about and what people were able to do. And so why is it so important, I think? And I think it's important because we have a history that is full, rich, yeah, full, rich, and bold. And we're going to fill up this book to 1955 and beyond. Now, there is something else we can fill also. It's called the Sankofa African Heritage Museum. That's, that is being worked upon right now with an organization called African American Unity. And I think Mr. Ricky Rogers is here. Raise your hand, Ricky. I know you're here somewhere. There you are. And there, the plans uh, put together by Mr. Lane Allen, who's sitting right next to him. Raise your hand, Lane, who's had an uh, extended uh, time and experience here, architect. Those plans they're having and working at, and you think about this. You're talking from 1865 up to today and what you can feel 
with regards to what African Americans did, live, everything here in just a war. And to be able to take that and use it to fill that museum. And we have uh, these, these are interviews, uh, video interviews of like Ms. Peterson. Uh, I just about two months ago completed the interview with Fred Rogers. You know, and Fred Rogers unfortunately passed away uh, last Friday. And uh, uh, and Mr. Carver, I was able to interview him long before you know he got ill. And uh, Mrs. Mooney, uh, who lived over in Pattersonville at that time when I interviewed her, she was in her 90s. And so we have all this information here that, and there's more that we 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 must gather this for future generations, for people to know what was it like, what what did you do. You know, what, what did African Americans do? How did you guys coexist? The interest, another interesting story, and Kylie, Kylie knows uh, of the stories I have that I always come in and I have another one for her. And she's like, this one was um, where individuals always talked about it. I said, well, you know, you had the 66 Club and it's sit right next to the Turner's Club. Wow. Yeah. You know, white folks in this building. Black folks in the building, but y'all had some rough times and stuff. And everybody looks at me like, what the heck are you talking They did their thing, we did ours. It didn't bother us, it didn't bother us. Okay. And that's what you get. And you and we we also ask, what was your life growing up here in the world? What, what, how would you describe it? And many of them have said, you know, I had a very good child life growing up in the world. Now, to say it didn't exist, wake up and smell the coffee, okay? But to show how this community was able to grow with all the individuals as a cluster of moving its way forward is, is something that I think that we want to be able to tell, we want to be able to have that out there. So one of the things, again, those of you who are here and those of you are, who are viewing on Facebook and uh, on Zoom, if you have information, you have documents and so forth, this is my contact information. It's Aurora's history. And I think all of us can help get it told. And so at this point, I think I've got a couple of uh, minutes left. And I can answer any questions anyone might have with regards to what I was presenting. I did a great job. Nobody <laughs> <has that. laughs> oh, I appreciate that. You know, that makes me feel good. Nobody got up and left. I only saw, <laughs> only saw a couple of years not, but you know, I, 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 I moved to Aurora in 1982. I lived on uh, apartments, uh, Cedarwood Apartments, Indian Trail and Farnsworth. When we first moved uh, to Aurora, and then we moved to uh, 421 East Downer Place. Uh, and then from there, uh, bought a house out on 443, 445 Plum Street. And I had, that was an interesting thing I had never seen in other communities. Uh, you had a lot of homes here that I had a big house on the front and a little small house on the, on the rear. And that's the way our our, our lot was. And we lived in the, the, the four bedroom house and we rented out the back house. And for someone starting with a young family to be able to have that that little back house that really helped to you know move you along. But uh, it was it was an interesting time uh, in Aurora. And the thing that among other things that always freaked us out was we would bring the kids down here to the old library uh, down here on Stoke, and we would go to park. And uh, you look, you know, Chicago, you know, you, you put your quarter in, you might have got half an hour. Out here, you put your penny in, you got 24, 30 minutes. <laughs> and I was like, 30 minutes for one penny? Oh, dude, this, this was, y'all, I mean, this, so there was just a number of things here that made Aurora, you know, really stand out and say, hey, I, I really, I'm really glad to see, you know, a number of things that, I'm glad I moved here and my kids raised them and, and uh, what they experienced. Yes, sir. 
So uh, my family is primarily, uh, as you were describing how folks moved from the South, my folks here, uh, both sides were from, because they went to Chicago. So it was the Georgias and the Carolinas and those folks kind of went to Chicago. And like I said, Mississippi's and such, they mm -hmm. came to this area, the summer to Chicago. But one thing I do remember is that they did mention Aurora a lot, even back in, you know, I'm talking about my grandparents are, you know, silent generation, greatest generation. Um, you know, so World War II folks, Aurora was mentioned in Chicago. So I'm wondering, maybe, and there's a lot more work, but Chicago newspapers and periodicals, the Chicago Defender, places like that may have some things that could connect or be like a link to maybe think of something for Aurora. So just an idea. Good idea. Good idea. And uh, I guess I'm dating myself. I used to work for the Defender as no, a photographer and freelance writer. Okay. That's and, uh, <laughs> so I always had access to their archives yeah, and yeah. so forth. And they were very instrumental in helping me to write my first book because wow. they gave me permission to use a lot of things out of the Defender uh, because I had still known some people there and so forth. So, no, that's a good idea. Wow. I'll bring it back to it. Anyone else? Yes. That some of the um, well to do white families in Aurora uh, employed domestic. Have you talked to um, those families? Yes, there was a number of, uh, and it wasn't just in Aurora. A number of them were in Batavia, uh, um, St. Charles, Geneva, uh, and a number of them, uh, Burgess Norton. Uh, and that was it. That's enough. I got a million stories, okay? Uh, but I was, uh, I was, remember, I was riding with a friend of mine who was a developer, and I told him that, yeah, I was just finishing interviewing uh, Mr. Carver. Mr. Carver, he said, oh, Henry? Yeah, Henry Cowherd. <laughs> and uh, he says, oh, yeah, Henry used to work for us. Who was us? My father ran Burgess Norton. No wonder you are who you are. Okay, <laughs> got it, got it. You understood. But those folks, they, there's a number of African-Americans that worked. And I, another story was young uh, African-Americans talking about when they were kids and they would go there and they would have tea parties and they were assigned to go and serve the tea and the crumpets and, and so forth. And, and uh, so, yes, that was quite, and, and as I mentioned, in the 30s and in the 40s, uh, really that was just an opportunity to really make men's uh, in terms of people allowing and, and letting them work for them uh, during those times. Really. Anyone else? If not, I want to again thank uh, the Royal Public Library uh, for allowing me to and Kylie here with the genealogy. If you want to know anything with regards to your family, if you have family here in Aurora, this lady here is one of the best and the library itself is sitting in it and you can see how it has a, 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 just a wide variety of uh, resources and all. The Aurora Historical Society, John Java, John, stand up, wait, let people know you're in the house. John here is a guy that I can send some stuff to. He come back and he emails me and he boom, 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 and then he comes out and says, here's a photo here. We found this great in terms of helping us to be able to do it. And all of those who have allowed me to interview them at this point, I want to thank you. We're going to be getting these uh, interviews uh, edited and then we're going to put them up on a YouTube uh, channel. But we have more to do. So again, I'm, I'm asking if you know of individuals, you've got my contact information, and uh, please let us know. We're willing to get out there and, and meet with them and interview them so we can be able to work on this book. In the back there is uh, just some more artifacts with the of African American life in Aurora, as well as those of you who have not purchased my book, my first book, Ted Strong Jr., uh, you can uh, you can uh, purchase it there, or you had your copy here tonight with you. I will autograph it for you. So, John, you have a yeah. Sure. I, I, I got, yeah. got a couple of pictures that I wanted to share. Come on up front here, so okay. And and maybe some of the people might be interested. They're probably the foremost people's time because these are in the uh, war World War Two era in the forties. Um, these are things that. Uh, our former curator, Dennis Buck, who is here tonight and who uh, wrote the, uh, the early book, From Slavery to Glory, uh, he did a couple of uh, exhibits where uh, he kind of gathered some photos from uh, African-American families. Uh, one exhibit was called uh, Reflecting Black, and these are just, uh, some blown up images 
Uh, we've got uh, a photo here uh, that we think is a Bible school or similar event, probably about 1943 or 44, possibly at the Wayside Cross Mission. And uh, uh, you can see it's it's a you know uh, definitely integrated group, and uh, a lot of a lot of these people uh, were people that were born in the 30s. So a lot of them are no longer with us. I, I did check on some of these, and uh, a number of them have passed. But uh, at at one time. Uh, for a number of years, there was a what was that called, Dennis? The reunion, the the reunion that uh, was done with the, uh, the black community, uh, like it was called like Fox Valley reunion or something like that. And uh, a lot of the uh, uh, African American folks in the in the area would come and meet once a year. We did, or maybe it was every other year. We did a couple at the uh, downtown Art and History Center. And at that time, uh, a number of people identified uh, those who they could uh, remember, or some of them were probably in here. Uh, and then another one of the photos that uh, Dennis had found was, uh, this is some of the war mothers uh, during World War II. Um, uh, Dory Miller was a uh, African American uh, from Texas who uh, was at Pearl Harbor Hero. Uh, I think he was uh, killed a couple of years later in 1943. And there was a, a Dory Mother War Mothers. Uh, Dory Miller War Mothers uh, was a, a national organization for African American uh, women, and there were chapters in different places. Aurora had a chapter, and uh, these ladies were uh, doing the war work uh, at home. Uh, these are just a couple of, of the photos. And again, this is probably 1943 or 1944. Uh, but you may recognize some of these ladies if you're, if you're a longtime member in the African American community. I guess we'll leave them up up here and you can take a look. Yeah, yeah. show the people. I'm sorry, I got to show it on. Show, yeah. Oh, sure. yeah. Were those war mothers also gold star, like what would you consider gold star fans? Uh, no, I think that, uh, not necessarily. Yeah. Okay. So I, I, I suppose some had uh, people that uh, you know, were, were killed, but uh, I think most of them were, uh, you know, they had sons, uh, maybe daughter serving and uh, some might have been just some of the community leaders who were the, the women in the black community who wanted to help out. Isn't it something that we do it virtually now? Any other questions anyone might have? If not, what is on your website? Well, the historical society uh, right now, uh, our downtown site is open. Uh, that's the David Pierce Art and History Center, 20 East Downer. It's open uh, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday from noon to 4, and Saturday from 10 to 4. However, uh, that's not where our archives are located. Our archives are only uh, by appointment. So you, uh, but you could come down and talk to us, and uh, we could kind of determine whether we might, might be able to help you out if you're looking for uh, something in particular on your family. Anyone else? If not, I'm gonna turn it back over to Kylie and uh, many last uh, comments. No, thank you everyone so much. Thank you for having me. And there are surveys in the back if you didn't get one. All right, That's thank all. you everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night.